Okay, folks, uh, we've had some technical issues and uh, we have a, a slightly altered presentation that we're going to do for you today. Um, and uh, uh, Moira and Michelle are uh, going to see if they can get the slides up for us in the background. And if so, then we'll switch to the other presentation. Um, and uh, if that's not possible, then we'll just continue with a, a slightly alternate presentation. Um, I'm wondering if everyone can see the Learning Commons slide up in front of you. If you can, we just mentioned in the chat window just so that I know that people can see them. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah, I can see lots of yeses. Okay, that's uh, good. Okay, great. Okay. So this is the presentation that uh, uh, I did uh, previously. Um, uh, for Richmond Teach Librarians talking about the, the idea of learning commons. And uh, this will touch on some of the similar issues uh, that uh, Michelle and Moira were hoping to touch on today. Um, but just as a way of, uh, of framing the conversation, you know, we've heard a lot about uh, learning commons. It seems to be a new buzzword um, that's floating around. Um, we've got, um, uh, we've got uh, administrators uh, talking about learning commons, the senior staff talking about learning commons, and uh, the question is, what does that mean? Uh, what's the, what are the implications for us working in libraries? Um, is it the same thing? Is it different? Um, uh, the website that uh, that I'm on currently, I'm just going to um, uh, post this to the chat window so that you can um, um, go back to it later if you're interested. So uh, there you go. Um, and um, the uh, uh, the Ontario Teacher Librarians have uh, released some documents around what does Learning Commons mean, and there's a great little video that they have um, around this. I'm not going to play this uh, for you at, at the moment. You can watch it later on your own time. It's um, it's a good uh, promotional video about uh, what does library mean. Um, but the things that I think we need to talk about um, are uh, what is the what does the term learning commons mean? Um, where does that idea come from? Uh, and does does the origin of the idea have an implication for us working in school libraries? And is this something that we need? Is this something that we uh, uh, that we want to climb on to? So I think when we uh, when we talk about uh, learning commons in library. Uh, we are trapped to a certain extent by, uh, by the preconceived notions that libraries have uh, in the popular imagination. Uh, if you remember back to uh, It's a Wonderful Life, uh, when um, the, the main character decided not to live his life and his future wife ended up not meeting him and not marrying him, she ended up having the worst possible fate, which was she ended up being a librarian. This is, <laughs> this is painted as sort of a, a terrible, horrible thing for um, uh, a terrible fate. Um, library to most people is a lot of shushing, lots of books, uh, students working on their own, um, things being the way they've always been, um, funny rules about how we shelve things, um, needing to have an expert to guide you through to find stuff. We've seen an effort to rebrand libraries in the last few years. I've seen all kinds of terms being used to describe a library, uh, school uh, library media center, school library resource center, uh, library media center, virtual library, digital library. Um, Australia has a um, quite an investment in what they call i-centers now. Um, in French, uh, you'll often hear libraries called Centre de Documentation. We're thinking of, of new ways to maybe reframe what we do. And what we've seen lately, of course, is the idea of learning commons um, as, as a term. So why the word commons? Well, the word commons really comes from that notion of the village green. Uh, the idea of the commons, a social utility space where people come together to, to find a shared resource that they can use together. Um, this space doesn't belong to any one person. Uh, it's uh, useful for all kinds of things. You can have multiple activities, multiple users. It's shared resources and in a sense it's, a, it's community ownership. 
And so the idea of the commons in geographic terms uh, has been repurposed um, to talk about what we do in libraries. And so we transfer that idea of uh, the commons, the village commons, into the idea of the learning commons. So uh, we have, again, multiple activities, we have multiple users, we have uh, shared resources that don't just belong to the library, and they belong to everybody, students and teachers, and the idea that the entire community of the school um, has a sense of ownership around it. Now, this may not be any different from the kinds of things that you've been doing in your library all along, but to a certain extent, I think we, um, by, by rebranding, by re-imaging ourselves, what we do is we draw attention back to the very good things that have been happening uh, in libraries all along. So um, as part of this conversation, uh, we could ask, our, ask ourselves, well, what could a, a library commons look like or information commons or learning center? So this is a, this is a place that has a lot of different uh, a lot of different aspects to it, some services that we've already offered in the past, some new ideas, some new services that we might think of offering in the future. I think an important thing to, to grasp in this conversation around learning commons is the idea that it is, it is a library, but a library plus. So it's not that we're looking to replace library with learning commons, but what we're doing is we are we are taking all of the good things that we know work well in a library and we are adding to that the additional elements that make it a learning commons. Um, I think there's a danger in some cases to think that, oh, you know, we're, we're get, getting rid of the library, we're putting in a learning commons. Uh, what does that mean? Um, I think we have to resist that notion. I think what we want to say is that we are, we are adding to the good programs and the good facilities and the good resources that we already have. So it's, a, it's an addition to, it's not a replacement of. So learning commons are characterized by having a full service learning space for research and, and projects, um, a range of, um, of activities and spaces for that. So quiet spaces for studying, uh, places for impromptu gatherings, uh, flexible furnishings that can be moved around, so perhaps shelves on wheels, uh, folding tables, uh, a range of different kinds of seating areas, um, carpets, stools, chairs. Uh, spaces that support student-to-student -student work, student-to-faculty work, student-to-equipment, or student-to-information interactions, with the focus being on active, engaged, inquiry-based learning. I think one of the, the ways that we can characterize uh, a learning commons is to think of it less as a grocery store, which is more the typical idea, I think, of, of a library in some people's minds, a place where you go and you pick up the ingredients you need for your project and then you go away and you put together your project. So rather than, than thinking of it as a grocery store, we think of it more as a community kitchen. So I bring things to the community kitchen, uh, ingredients that I found. There will be some ingredients available at the community kitchen. There will be cooking spaces and cooking surfaces and cooking utensils and the help of other chefs to work with. And so what I do in that community kitchen is I, is I cook together <laughs> with other people and then uh, I'm able to share my creation. So if we think of a, of a library learning commons as a community kitchen, rather than a grocery store, I think that brings us closer to the idea of what we're looking for uh, when we're talking about reconceptualizing this, these spaces. And you may be doing these kinds of things yourself already. And, uh, and I don't think there's a magic point where you can say, okay, at this point I was a library, now I'm a learning commons. It, it is, of course, a continuum, and so we want to be uh, thinking along that continuum. But I think the community kitchen is a very powerful analogy because it, uh, it, it kind of flips the, what we're doing in the space on its head. So this is really a shopping list of all kinds of things that we could have. And of course, we're limited by the existing space we have. Some of us have libraries that are 
quite modest, not very right. big, um, lots and lots of shelves, but not a lot of room to turn around. And so this is going to be a uh, this is going to be an issue when you're thinking of reconceptualizing um, your library. But I think we do what we can, and um, we can pull in elements that um, that work for our space and our community. So ideally, you'd have a central space, with lots of room, plus you'd have meeting rooms around, tutoring centers, advisory offices, a range of materials available, maker space, um, lots of artwork, a variety of technology available, iPads and iPods and laptops and desktops, but of course, um, you know, we're talking, uh, we're talking funding uh, and support for sort of the ideal situation. So who's doing uh, learning commons? Um, well, I guess when we think about the history of learning commons, we have to think about um, where the idea came from. Uh, we have universities around North America that, are, that were looking for ways to pull students into their space. And so at the university level, a learning commons really sees the learner as uh, self-motivated, self-directed, personalized, who uh, is able to come into the space uh, and with a variety of needs, uh, working individually or with others, accessing the resources as they are made available, uh, being very self-directed. Um, this was a way of bringing students back into the library spaces. Um, university libraries reconfigured their space in order to facilitate these kinds of activities. You had lounges, you had reading areas, you had um, food services uh, integrated into the library space, um, lots of electronic resources, the idea that you could be part of the learning commons even if you weren't physically in the space, so uh, a great virtual outreach. And so all of this um, works well in the university setting. Uh, you have um, essentially adult students in the space, you have lots of responsible behavior, you have lots of support, um, people accessing things as they need them. Now, this is a great idea and it has lots of, uh, lots of appeal and some of those things can be brought down to, um, to the high school level. Um, so the example that is often mentioned in BC is the the John Oliver space, which uh, which Moira was responsible for, and um, what John Oliver had going for it is a very large, flexible space, um, multiple areas to work individually or in small groups or in large groups. Uh, she had room to accommodate maybe three classes at a time, plus uh, space for kids to do individual work, side meeting rooms, very flexible. Of course. Uh, high school students aren't motivated to the same extent as university students, and so there are some issues around responsible behavior and, and you know, do we allow the same kind of complete autonomy that we would allow in a university setting. So the idea of the learning commons then needs to be adjusted for, um, for high school students. And then as we move down to the elementary level, of course, there's other considerations. Students have, uh, again, uh, a little bit less autonomy given to them. I think one of the things that we want to foster in this space is the idea that students will have the opportunity to explore things that are of interest to them. But as students are younger in the space, I think they're going to need more support, a little bit more direct intervention. It's not going to be the learning commons as envisioned by a university uh, setting. So I think that's important to, to keep in mind and as we read things about learning commons that apply to college and university level, we're going to have to adapt that, what that looks like um, in, the, in the space uh, for an elementary school. Um, so is, is learning commons an important, um, uh, an important movement? Is it just a different name? Is it, uh, is it something that we need to be um, participating in? I think it's important because it signals a shift towards the kind of work that we're doing in the space. So calling it a learning commons versus a library allows us to 
also rethink the kind of project work that we're doing. So we move away from the bird project or the country project and think more about uh, collaborative interactions and uh, inquiry-based projects where students have an opportunity to uh, explore problems and solve problems. I love the, the, the whole Genius Hour um, movement and I think that the Genius Hour movement lends itself very well to the idea of the learning commons because what we want to do is we want to encourage students to, to think about that personalized, individualized approach to their learning and then have a space where they can do that, where they can be supported by a knowledgeable adult, surrounded by interesting resources, and then have a chance to experiment a little bit with their learning. And if there's a maker space involved, then we even have a chance for kids to do the, the hands-on building of, of ideas and projects that they may have in mind. Our curriculum is moving towards this idea of personalized, individualized learning. And I know that there's a lot of, um, you know, the sort of the buzzwords, around that, is this, just a, is this just a fad, is this something that we're, you know, is this a, just a, a new way of talking about the same old thing? I think it's important for us to, as teacher librarians, to look at the initiatives that are happening in districts and provincially and to see where what we're doing, uh, at all the good things that we've always been doing in library, where those things line up to support them. Because I think, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with uh, tying your wagon to a rising star. And I think if we find uh, initiatives and ideas uh, in uh, uh, ministry documents and in district initiatives that, uh, that are positive, that are good for kids, I think we go with that. And I think we, uh, we yoke our, li our library programs to that in a positive way. I think that's good. I think what it also does is it gives a new way of talking about the kinds of things that we do. So, you know, the language around libraries and what's a library, um, people end up thinking that they know exactly what you're talking about. You start talking about libraries, oh yeah, I know what the library is, I know what you do, you stamp books, <laughs> etc. I think the value of um, this, this new label, this uh, Learning Commons label, is it gives us an opportunity to represent to our stakeholders the kinds of services and the kinds of resources that we have available. So emphasizing the idea of collaboration, emphasizing the idea of communication, emphasizing uh, the idea of creation. Uh, these things are, are valuable and we can help with that as teacher librarians in schools. Um, what are the, the limiters, the downsides, the issues around moving from uh, library to learning commons? Of course, uh, none of this can happen without support. So we have, um, we have teacher librarians who um, are trying to make new things with, uh, with the old facility they have. There is some cost involved for this. Uh, without financial support, very difficult to, uh, to meet all of those needs. Um, the idea of being a victim of your own success, uh, you know, we, we do want uh, kids down. We do want... Uh, teachers visiting, we do want to be accessed, but um, if you're a part-time teacher librarian, uh, your, your schedule is going to be filled, uh, filled completely. So that's, that's a good thing, but it's something to be aware of. Um, and we have to think about uh, rethinking the features and functions that we offer normally in the library. Are we still going to be able to do those same things? Uh, we can't do everything, so to the extent that we add new services, we have to think about maybe letting go of some other things. So these are some things to think about. Um, is the audio still working? Can you, can you still hear me? Okay, good. <laughs> okay, good. I, I see a note saying that we've lost the audio and then suddenly I wonder if I'm just talking to myself. Um, I think the other important thing to um, uh, to add uh, to this discussion is the um, is the virtual side, and this is something that is I think key when we're talking about moving from library to learning commons. Um, we have in the past as teacher librarians, we've prided ourselves on having uh, spaces that uh, showcase print resources, um, reference sections, 
uh, nicely laid out fictions uh, with some room to glorification to try and feature different kinds of uh, reading materials. We have uh, accessible displays. We try to be very clear about where things are. Uh, simplify Dewey sometimes in order to make the, the materials uh, accessible for kids. So we spent a lot of effort and a lot of time on the physical layout of the library. But one of the things that a learning commons, uh, by its definition, has built into it is the notion of uh, a virtual access. And so, um, uh, so what do we, um, what can we do about um, about virtual access? We have to think about things like. Um, uh, we have to think about things like uh, blog, uh, website, uh, Twitter feed, social media. Uh, students need to be able to access the resources that we have from wherever they happen to be. And so they may not be coming into the space. They may also be accessing the space from their classroom. They may be accessing it from home. So there's a variety of, uh, of access points to the material that we have. We have uh, databases. We have uh, ebooks, we have um, wikis. There's a whole range of resources available to students. And part of our job, I think, as teacher librarians in uh, a learning commons is helping kids match those resources up with the needs that they have. Um, it, it is a big job. Um, one of my issues when I was a teacher librarian in high school was putting links together for students, and then a week later, a month later, two months later, the links going dead, materials not available. So um, you know, this is, this is a big job, the idea of um, creating the virtual presence. But I think without the virtual presence, um, our utility to students, uh, the timeliness of what we can provide to students uh, is just not there. So. Um, this is going to mean for those of us that don't have a robust web presence, thinking about how we might do that. Can we enlist um, a student? Can we enlist uh, the IT teacher, perhaps, to assist with that? Um, there are things uh, that we can do to have a stronger web presence, and um, that essentially would be a uh, probably a much longer <laughs> webinar. But I think we have a responsibility to bring ourselves up to date as much as possible, think about platforms that we can use to deliver material to our kids. Because without an, a robust online presence, from the student's perspective, the material we're providing is, is marginal at best. Um, and I think we're going to see this as we look at the kinds of resources that we purchase for our libraries. Um, I know um, there's, a, uh, there's a question around, do I buy more? print materials for my nonfiction uh, collection, or do I begin to look at e-resources for that? Right now, not every kid has a device, but I think that's coming. And so we may need to look at the balance between e-resources and print resources and look for sort of an equilibrium between those so that students can find particularly useful print resources in my library, but then access uh, really helpful e-resources as well. So I think this is a uh, this is a uh, this is a big issue. Uh, implications for your space uh, and for teaching and learning. So I think we have uh, we have a number of things here. Um, we want to as much as possible see how we can have students be in the driver's seat around their. Um, around their learning. Um, if, the, if the goal is for more individualized, personalized learning, do we allow students to have a more uh, directive role in, in the kinds of things that they do? Um, we need to help students make connections across subjects and disciplines. Um, a learning commons allows a bit of the free range thinking and the free range researching. Uh, and we can help teachers put together projects that f favor those kinds of things. Uh, we want to extend an invitation to students to be more active participants in their own learning. 
Um, I mentioned the idea of the community kitchen. Uh, I think the idea of the library as a hands-on lab for learning. I think this is a this is a, an excellent thing. And you know, I think back to my role as a teacher librarian uh, in the high school. Um, I would often field questions from students on a range of topics, even things that I wasn't particularly uh, knowledgeable about, physics, calculus, uh, whatever it happened to be. But I think we have a role to play as a knowledgeable adult in a setting and to help uh, jumpstart the, the brainstorming project, uh, process with kids. Um, ask me a question, I may not have the answer, but I have some tools, some mental tools at my disposal for trying to figure out how to find that answer. And so, so this, I think, is what um, we do in a, in a learning commons with uh, students in a school. We are one of those many adults in their lives that can help them jumpstart the, the, the brainstorming process. And part of that means providing access to um, space to work, tools to work with, equipment, options, expertise. So it's not really a particular layout that makes a learning common. It's not a particular, uh, it's not buying a bunch of leather chairs. It's not putting in a Keurig a coffee machine. Uh, it's really about creating a space that supports an approach to learning, a way of thinking um, about, about the space. Um, at the end of this, um, uh, uh, at, at the end of um, uh, this presentation that you have in front of you, there is a, uh, there's a list of additional links um, that, that you can follow up on. I think there's a lot of material here, uh, some food for thought. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at that material as much as possible. Um, I just want to um, add one sort of uh, summing up comment to this, and that's the idea that um, we need to be um, firmly in the driver's seat around um, around defining what learning commons means in our schools. Um, there are uh, there are lots of opportunities for um, senior staff and administrators in schools to say, learning commons is a new thing. We want to be part of this. We want to have a learning commons in our school. But unless we are clear as teacher librarians what learning commons means and what it looks like, I think that um, we can end up being hijacked by other people's agendas. And we want to be really clear that um, as, as teacher librarians, we have a hand on the notion of, of learning commons. So uh, my suggestion, and I've seen this in some of the documentation uh, around the idea of learning commons, is to pair the, the name of the library with the new name of Learning Commons so that we associate firmly in people's minds that the two go together. So rather than calling it Learning Commons, uh, I would suggest that we use the full expression School Library Learning Commons so that in the minds of people that we, uh, that we engage with, parents, teachers, administrators, senior staff, we're not talking about Learning Commons as something separate from the library, but in fact, what we're talking about is the school library learning commons. And I would uh, encourage people to use uh, SLLC as your acronym, uh, or at the very least, library learning commons as your acronym. I think this is an important, um, uh, this is an, an important uh, uh, stand to take on this issue. Um, I've heard out there um, that there are situations where schools, administrators um, have created learning commons that are not associated with the library. So you have a student lounge simply called the learning commons, which divorces the notion of what a learning commons can be from the library space. Um, what you end up with is the idea of learning commons being associated with couches and chatting. It needs to be more than that. So I think we have a strong role to play as, um, as teacher and librarians in staking out uh, the territory and the definition and making library learning commons uh, a part of our vocabulary uh, around what we do. Um, I'm hoping that um, uh, I'm hoping that you uh, you've had a chance to uh, pick up the uh, the link from this presentation. 
Um, I don't know if there are uh, any questions. I can see that uh, that Moira was able to um, uh, get some slides up, I think. Um, so um, uh, I think maybe um, uh, we'll have a chance to maybe put up some information on the BPTLA site um, on their particular um, uh, on their particular presentation. Um, are there any um, any questions from uh, from folks in the room about uh, about uh, the presentation today? Any ideas that you'd like uh, some clarification? So I see there's a question about um, about funding. Yeah, you know, um, uh, so I think we're limited by the uh, by the space that you have, and unless you've got some re reconstruction happening, uh, you're going to be limited by the four walls that you have around you. Um, I think part of that is a is as much a reconceptualization as anything, and I, I would suggest maybe on paper taking everything out of the room and thinking, okay, what where what can I do with the space that I have, um, and I think. One relatively easy way to think about this is, um, and this this actually isn't really around funding per se, but this is just around uh, rethinking the resources. Um, if we really very seriously uh, deselect our collection uh, to create some space, we might find that um, a room that's full of shelves might in fact we might only need half the shelves, and that will allow us to create a little bit more room. So there's no there's, there's no money needed there. That's just a matter of taking out the stuff that nobody's using and then uh, rearranging the space a bit. I think the, the actual question around funding, though, whether it comes to new furniture, whether it comes to maybe getting some more electronic resources or more electronic um, devices uh, in the hands of kids and, and future librarians, has to do with um, really um, tying this whole initiative to the new direction in transforming curriculum, uh, the whole question around personalizing learning, and really helping your administrator and your parents group see that this library plus library learning commons that we're doing is going to be a direct benefit to kids in the long run. And so to the extent that we can tie that together, I think there is the opportunity to create funds. Parents, you know, parents want obviously the best for their kids. Um, to the extent that we can make this an exciting venture, I think we'll find that there might be some funds um, available um, for that. I'm just looking to take a quick look to see uh, what some of the other people have. Um, Here. So Cecilia says suggestions about transitioning uh, to uh, a library learning commons in a part-time position. Yeah, you know, um, I think it's a question of um, picking an element that you are most comfortable with and bringing that element to the fore in your practice. So um, whether it's uh, maybe um, creating a little bit of an informal reading space in, or perhaps encouraging uh, grade six, seven teachers to, um, to participate in something like a genius hour and then allow students to come in on a bit of an ad hoc basis to work in, in pairs and in, you know, in, in a corner of the library so that the, the idea becomes this is a learning lab where I can come and explore ideas rather than I have to march down with my whole class at one time. I think that might be one positive way to do it. In, part, in a part-time situation, you're really limited. You have to pick and choose the things that, um, uh, that work. Um, um, just taking a quick look here to see if there's anything else. Um, uh, if anyone else has, uh, Jeff wants to know if anyone else has developed a description of the role of teacher librarian that reflects new opportunities and challenges. So, you know, um, uh, the, uh, the Canadian Library Association has an interesting link on their website that, um, uh, that's worth following up on. 
Um, and if I can uh, find the link a little later, I'll just add it to the website so that uh, you can take a look at that. Um, I think, um, uh, let's see if there's anything else here, 24-7. Um, um, yeah, there actually there's some uh, interesting suggestions also in uh, Moira, Moira and uh, Sylvia's document um, that I think it, um, is worth looking at. There is a, an extensive bibliography at the end uh, and some websites to consult and I think um, that's a, that's a very useful document to consult as far as that goes. Um, Genius Hour may have a question about that. So Genius Hour um, is uh, the idea that um, you um, uh, really springs from, from the notion of Google uh, giving their employees a certain amount of time in the week to work on whatever interests them as opposed to something for the company. And uh, the, the, the resulting um, uh, momentum for the company has been huge. Uh, all kinds of interesting projects have popped up. People are much keener to go to work. They feel a little bit more self-actualized around that. And so the idea of Genius Hour is that you would give students some time every week to pursue something they're interested in. So it might be, you know, a question that they, they're, they've always been wondering, uh, what's the best design for a skateboard, or um, how, did they, how are Tootsie Rolls made, or you know, whatever, whatever it happens to be. So it, it doesn't have to be attached to curriculum at all, but of course students are learning some research skills and some thinking skills and some presentation skills around that. Uh, you give them a chance to research a topic and then uh, they get a chance to share their findings with, um, um, with, their, with their grade level kids in their class. So it really gives kids a chance to follow up on the things that they want. Uh, they, that they want to know more about rather than the rain falling through or something like that. Um, Michelle asks, is there some work being done with regards to the new curriculum and learning commons? You know, um, library learning commons is sort of one of those things that, um, that doesn't really have a clear ministry definition and so I think that that really underscores the importance for us as teacher librarians in the province to to stake our claim on this. Um, the, the transforming curriculum stuff that we're seeing talks about um, giving students more options, um, more choices, pursuing things they're interested in, but they're going to need help with that. They're going to need knowledgeable adults uh, to support them and uh, provide direction for them when they when they ask for it. And so this is a key role that teacher librarians are going to be playing. And I think the extent to which we can talk up the value of what we do, I mean, this is nothing new, but talk up the value of what we do, as well as the important role that our new school library learning commons has in this whole picture, I think this is going to be much more valuable. Do I have sound? I didn't even speak to that. I can hear somebody else uh, chiming in here. Um, just let me see that, because I turned my sound off. Okay, I can hear. It sounds like Richmond teacher librarians are popping in with some uh, on their microphone. Um, okay, and then Sarah says, going back to the idea of part-time uh, teacher librarians, do you know of any elementary mm -hmm. schools with part-time teacher librarians that have transitioned to uh, library Learning Commons. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I know that Sylvia Zubke in, uh, in Vancouver um, has, um, I, I think, has felt relatively um, uh, successful with the kinds of things that she's doing. Um, her focus has been more on providing flexible space and flexible as much as possible flexible timing for kids to come into the, the space and work with her and work with the resources. I think that's going to have to look a little bit different in, um, uh, in each context. And I think the key thing for this is that we, we begin talking about our spaces as library learning commons and then we, we pick an aspect that we're most comfortable with developing. And it's a little bit of a a la carte menu we can't do it all, but I think we can uh, accessorize, if that makes sense, we can accessorize our programs with an aspect or two of what Learning Commons looks like 
and then over time, um, with support, well, hopefully some funding, um, keep your fingers crossed, maybe some staffing, that, um, that we can move more and more towards this idea of learning commons um, in, a, in a true sense. Um, Heather makes a comment. Uh, it's so great to talk about how uh, wonderful um, this, uh, the, the space is, but without a teacher librarian involved, we don't, um, we don't have, it's not really a learning commons, it's a, it's a book room. So, um, okay, so I guess we're, we're pretty much out of uh, time at this point. I don't know if there's any other questions uh, that people have. Um, Okay, can, uh, can people still hear me and just, uh, okay, yes, okay, great. So I, I don't want to feel like I'm, uh, I'm talking into the void here. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that this has been somewhat inter uh, of interest to you. Unfortunately, we weren't able to do the, the presentation as originally advertised, but we'll, um, we'll, we'll hopefully be able to get some stuff up um, for, um, for you around. to the document that Moira and uh, Michelle are going to present. Um, I'll just mention then uh, that uh, I think the key thing about these, um, these webinars really is the conversations that happen among professionals as a result. So I don't pretend to have all the answers, and I don't think in the subsequent webinars you're going to hear all the answers either. But it's really an opportunity for conversation. And as Ron Richard says in his work around making thinking visible, we only do our best um, thinking when we actually talk about what's rattling around in our heads. So hopefully in your various districts and with your various colleagues, you'll have an opportunity to tease this topic out a little bit. What's a learning commons? What's a school library learning commons? What does that mean for us? Uh, can we stake out this the, a claim to this new property in our schools and in the minds of our administrators and parents and teachers so that it becomes something that we can work with. I think that's very important. I encourage you to have the conversation um, some more. Uh, Sarah wants to know if she can uh, send me an email. Absolutely. Um, um, I'm, I'm quite happy to talk more about this. Um, I'll just mention once again that we have three uh, more webinars coming. Uh, the, the next one is on differentiating instruction. Uh, with EBSCO resources. So, uh, we will also have one on selection and deselection and perfection in your collection <laughs> with Mark Crompton from uh, uh, St. George's and uh, he's quite excited about that presentation and then we'll have a session on finding Aboriginal resources for your school library learning commons. So there will be a registration link up uh, shortly on the BCTLA site and that will allow you to uh, leave us an e email contact that then we can send you a direct uh, email of the um, of the archive links when they become available. So thank you very much, everyone, um, and and uh, we will uh, we'll talk to you hopefully soon. And hope that you found this uh, useful and enjoyable. And we'll um, uh, we'll uh, we'll talk to you later. Thank you very much.